Okay, um, we're going to get started. So, uh, welcome to uh, a panel discussion. Um, the topic is open source for good. Uh, we have a much longer title than that, um, but I won't bore you with the whole title. But basically what we're going to do is talk to you all a little bit about the Ospos for Good conference uh, that happened in July. You'll have heard it referenced in Omar's keynote this morning. Um, and we're just going to kind of um, chat about what the, the highlights of the conference were, some of the main lessons, and um, talk to you a little bit about our conference report, which is going to be published shortly. Um, and there's some big lessons around kind of global cooperation and the open source community and how we can bring those two together. Um, so to join me, I have an esteemed panel, including uh, Omar Moisen, who's the open source coordinator at the United Nations, um, Sachiko Muto, who's a senior researcher at RISE Research Institutes of Sweden and the chair at Open Forum Europe, Ruthie Kega, who works with uh, the Chaos Project um, as a community lead and also as a manager at uh, OSPO Now, we also have uh, Fiona Krakenburger, who's a co-founder at the Sovereign Tech Fund, soon to be the Sovereign Tech Agency, um, and Hilary Carter, who's a Senior Vice President for Research and Communications at the Linux Foundation. So uh, we're going to start off with a brief intervention by Omar. We'll follow up with a presentation of the forthcoming report by Sachi Ko, and then we have a panel for you all. Um, so Omar, take it away. Thank you very much. Good to see you guys. So, uh, oh. yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Omar Mosin. I work for the United Nations Office of ICT and the UN Office for Technology Envoy. And I lead the whole open source engagement and the, the op whole other open source adoption within, within the UN. So quick words about OSPO for Good, the genesis of this conference, where it came about and what are some of the things we're trying to achieve through this conference. So it all started in 2014 three where we had our first one it was supposed to be a small gathering of experts that coming from several places in the world and then without with us even realizing it turned out to be much bigger than what we had but more the 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 here we have this big convening power as UN. We have the trust, we have access to government and we really looked around and we couldn't see a big global open source conference that is really bring in all the regions and then bring in all the stakeholders. So we wanted, we designed it, we dreamt it to be a place where we have government, meet private sector, meet universities, meet the open source foundations and, and, and the community. And then we also looked around, there's a lot of places where Europe talks to Europe and there's a lot of places where North America talks to North America, but there's really nothing global where we can have a global presence, Africa, the whole five continents. So this is how it started after the success of 2024. A lot of, uh, we had 80 participants, so it wasn't as massive, but it was a lot more than what we had in mind. And we did a survey and we asked people, what did you like about it? And a lot of things came up that really was a big learning thing for us is a lot of play, uh, OSPOs of government said that they didn't know that other government have different OSPOs. So as you know, there's this now big massive, uh, there's a, part of the open source revolution that is now touching public administration is that a lot of ministries, government, uh, or cities, sometimes regional, regional government are building their OSPOs, the open source program office. It's just a place where to adopt. This is the, your driver in the open source world. So what we realized there that the OSPO of Germany has the exact same problem than the OSPO of Mexico and has the same problem than the OSPO of Morocco. And the value they got from being in one place and be able to talk to each other, to be able to share. This is something that came up very strong. So this is why with our partners, we designed the next, the 2025 and we, uh, the 2024, and just a few words about it, about the work that was done and the conference itself is that we didn't want it to be a UN conference in the sense that it's designed by the UN. We want it to be really together with everyone. So what we did is we designed three committees, one for program, one for participation, because we had to make sure that in the room we have the right people that we want, and then one for comms and outreach. And in each of these committees, this committee met for six months, five months before the conference. Each of these committees, we had a very big variety of, of, of people be there. So committee of program, we had somebody like Mitchell Baker from Mozilla. We had people from German Chancellery. We had OFE was leading that. So we had each of these committees, we had five to 10 
open source ecosystem, people who actually know the, 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 the topic much better than us, help us design the conference. And thanks for Hillary. I know you were part of the Meeting. communication committee. So these committees work together. And then the participation committee was really key. We had a lot of people from Asia, Africa, and so on, because we wanted to make sure that in the room we have the, a real diversity. We wanted to have a big presence. We had to have strong gender diversity. We had to have strong geographic diversity, but also stakeholder diversity. We wanted to have not only government there. It would be a boring conference. Not boring. Important, but <laughs> not as thrilling as having, and vice versa. You see what I mean? So we had that specific, <laughs> it's recorded, I'll be in trouble. <laughs> I don't know if you attended the UN committee, it's not the most fun thing in the world. So this is what we wanted to be a UN committee. We really, so this committee on participation job was to make sure that we have to invite the right people and make sure we have the right people in the room. So these committees worked really hard and we were very happy. I think we put together a very interesting conference. We had six entities co-organizing it. So we had the government of Germany, government of Kenya, and then we had two UN entities, the UN Office of ICT and the UN Tech Envoy. And we had two think tanks because it was also really important for us that we have a multi-stakeholder. So we had OFE. My left and right colleagues, are, uh, neighbors are part of OFE. And then we had OSPO++. So really, it's just, we really worked hard that is not just designed by us or run by us, it's, that it's a together thing. So the conference, the program, how long do I have? <laughs> like a minute. A minute. So the conference, very quickly, we did, had, uh, uh, it was two days. We, we wanted to be worth for people to come to New York. Uh, it was inside the UN, so it was important to give it this UN feel, institutional feel to people to see that it's, this is part of something much bigger than us. And then the other thing, we had the design, the, 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 the discussions to be really relevant for today's thing. So we had a first panel was about AI and open source. Then we had panels discussion on on youth and open source. Thank you. We had uh, Ruth there. We had a young person. <laughs> young one young person. <laughs> we had thing about open source and the global south. We had discussion about open source and and. Uh, government. We had uh, one about open source at the UN. We said if we bring the whole world to the UN, we want to tell the UN story because there's incredible things happening within the UN. So we had these very interesting, diverse discussions and uh, we were very thrilled. At the end, we sent another survey. We had around 600 people who attended this time. And next year, we want to have we want to keep doubling this number. So next year we have a much bigger ambition. We want it to be much larger, much longer. We want it to be called the Open Source Week and to do more than just the two days. So uh, at the end, I'm sorry, uh, we sent this survey and overwhelmingly everybody liked it. We only had positive, other than coffee breaks, I think every comment was positive. We had a lot of coffee break things. So now we know open source people, they need their coffee. <laughs> So I promise you, next one, there will be coffee. So this is about OSPO for good. If you haven't been there, please get tune in. There's a, there's a website that is live. We're going to be doing a lot of announcement. We're looking to do regional OSPOs for good in Africa, in, in, in Asia, and so on. Those will be much smaller. Uh, get in touch. Happy to connect with you and share more with you. Thank you, Omar. Um, so Sachiko is going to talk a little bit about our conference report. Uh, we don't want this to be something that disappears into the wind after the conference happens. We actually want people to be able to understand and action some of the, the main takeaways from the conference. Um, I can say, you know, having participated in the writing of this report, that there's kind of two broad perspectives. One is around how can the open source community work with the UN and with um, kind of these ideas of global cooperation. Um, and then also, how can the UN work and support the, the global um, source um, the global open source ecosystem, uh, and how can it actually contribute back to the community? Um, so Sachiko, curious what you think some, are the, some of the main findings of the, the report are. Over to you. Thanks, Nick. And um, right, so we have already said there's going to be a 2025 conference, and we will have coffee breaks. You've been inspired. The coffee is here. Is a, sort of, there's a constant uh, supply of coffee here. Uh, I think there was a sort of, actually, you threw us a curveball that uh, it was like two weeks because Nick had worked on the program. And I think Omar, uh, two weeks before the event, he said, okay, 
we have to scrap the coffee breaks, right? <laughs> they removed all the coffee breaks that were, I'm sorry. <laughs> there was a security, a security issue. And you can't right? bring coffee into the ECOSOC chamber. No, no, there was a gift by the Swedish government, you know, <laughs> yeah, uh, to, well, to the UN. So it was, it's a beautiful, beautiful room. So we couldn't spoil it with them. Um, with, uh, with uh, be bringing beverages into the room. But um, so next year we'll also maybe, we'll have t-shirts we can learn. Yeah. That was also requested, so coffee breaks, uh, t-shirts and, and more young people. Yes, yes. so <laughs> those are kind of the three, I think, uh, three of the ways that we'll improve things uh, next year. But so I'm happy to talk briefly about the, the white paper that um, we're writing and that will be hopefully published uh, quite soon, um, and which is based on, on the outcomes of, of the conference. And so writing the report is a collaborative effort. Um, we're working with LF uh, and OFE and also RICE, uh, which is uh, my um, other hat, uh, RICE Research Institutes of Sweden. And, and a few others. Um, and also it's collaborative in the sense that, you know, it's not a research report, it builds really on the sort of the, the collective outcomes uh, and the inputs that we had into the, into the conference by the people, everybody that participated in the event. Um, before I, we sh I shouldn't take too much time because we need to, we don't have a pretty short panel, we want to get a discussion going. But I, as you're speaking, Omar, I was also reminded um, by, um, reminded of something that uh, Assistant General, Assistant Secretary General um, Bernardo Mariano said to us at the conference and he actually challenged us directly to say, if you're organizing future events, uh, make sure that you have or try to include a track, a panel, some discussion around the SDGs. And so I think we should pause and kind of also, you know, give credit to the LF, um, who is, I think, it's not the only panel that has a kind of focus on, you know, diversity, SDGs, um, etc. So I think that's good. Uh, OFE is also organizing the OFA symposium uh, in November uh, at uh, Harvard Business School, and we're also including um, a focus on 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 how uh, open source can help accelerate uh, the SDGs. So, um, so I think that's good. I know that the Eclipse Foundation is also focusing on sort of open source in Africa. Uh, and weren't you, you've participated in an event that Eclipse Foundation organized? Yeah, so that's, that's really great. Um, and so already last year, there was this smaller event. There was a recognition that not only technology is a key driver for achieving the SDGs, but you know, that open source really has an important role to play. And we were already told last year that um, that we need to also extend, you know, it's not about only uh, recognizing the power of open source and, you know, trying to apply that power to the SDGs, but also how can we extend the communities beyond, you know, um, yeah, go, go beyond what, who, is, who is currently in the room and see if we can uh, include also people from uh, diverse backgrounds. And something uh, that was said earlier today, and somebody, rec uh, somebody, your colleague from WHO, she reminded me of something, and that's also making this link, this explicit link between um, some public good and open source has been shown also um, by, researchers have shown that this um, has the effect of attracting uh, people with more diverse backgrounds. So I think it's very interesting. Um, if we talk about technology, open source technology, it's not only about, you know, the technology, it's about uh, being able through technology to achieve something. This has an effect that it actually in attracts other, uh, other contributors. So I think this is interesting since capability uh, capabilities and and um, and in including more people is going to be key to to um, to do more. And so this year's report, um, we started out by saying, where are we at when it comes to the SDGs? And I think uh, we are sort of rapidly, you know, you you presented the previous goals and you know also said uh, this morning in the in your keynote and said that we had achieved, you know. A, uh, that, the, yeah, three out of eight were achieved, and I think um, when it comes to the sustainable development goals that we have now, 
uh, the latest report shows that only 16% of those um, SDGs are sort of on track to be to be achieved by 2030. So there's a kind of there's a sense of urgency, and I think this is like where we want to put this this report uh, within this sense of urgency. Um, we had, I think, already at this conference, we also managed, I think, to to extend the you know what you talked about the different stakeholders uh, that came to the event. I think we have achieved a certain momentum within the open source community. And I think I can't talk here about everything that was included, this, that was in the conference, that's so included in the report, but a couple of things, you know, because also, Ruth, I know you'll talk about, you know, the youth aspect, which is very important. Fiona, you'll maybe talk about also the German government, who was a kind of, uh, was, a, was a sponsor of the event. Um, and the sort of the, the collaboration between public sector um, institutions and how that's an important uh, part of part of this. Um, I wanted to maybe mention only something that the Kenyan uh, rep government representative mentioned, which was he talked from experience of having himself been a product uh, of the open source community, talked about some of the ways that open source has or, had already achieved some important victories in Africa. So we shouldn't just think that we're starting from scratch. There is a vibrant community of open source developers um, in, in Africa and in other places. I know in South America, um, there is a very large open source community as well. Um, but sort of talking about the role that open source has already played and what and the role that it can continue to play to sort of big bring bring digital transformation to to the global south the global majority um, as we sort of um, renamed it in the conference um, and he also mentioned this challenge that we have today about this uh, increased polarization and fragmentation that we are seeing globally sort of this uh, geopolitical trends and how open source in that context can be seen as a, uh, as an important example of how what can be achieved if we collaborate globally. And there, I think, is where I also see that the UN can play an important role in, in making sure that we can use technology to collaborate, to achieve um, something together, and that we don't allow uh, our world to become, you know, so polarized that we cannot um, collaborate on, on these issues. So, yeah, um, only the security aspect I was, I'm going to mention as well, because that was an important outcome as well, that um, cybersecurity puts all the, all the, um, improve, like all the progress we make um, towards SDGs using technology, cybersecurity, like it, it brings all of that into, um, danger, let's say. And so it's important to ensure that we think security first and that it's not just an add-on for uh, for sort of premium users. So that was, um, yeah. Thank you, Sachiko. Um, so that's kind of what happened. Um, but I do want to get a little bit more philosophical and think about what comes next. So uh, thanks to the generous support of the Linux Foundation, we organized a whole other day of conferences after the main conference. And we had a session there um, at this What Next for Open Source events where um, people kind of expressed their frustrations, like, hey, this is all great, this is a good vision, but what are we actually going to do? You know, the open source community is the land of uh, version control and pull requests, and people really wanted something they could actually, you know, kind of work on. Um, so I wanted to kind of turn it over to the rest of our panelists to kind of present that more forward-looking perspective. Um, and I'll start with Hillary. Um, Hillary, you were one of the speakers at the conference. You spoke on a panel Sachiko mod moderated, um, discussing ways to engage the open source community. Um, very much a good fit, given your role on the communications committee. Um, and the panel focused on concrete ways that open source communities can leverage work and unite it with the global agenda to make progress on the SDGs. But I'm kind of curious what stood out to you during that session. Like, what do you make of this idea of op open source or OSPOs for good? Are you kind of more or less optimistic about the potential of using open source to, uh, to achieve the SDGs, given what you learned at the conference. Mm, thank you, Nick. And it's uh, wonderful to have this opportunity to recap the experience uh, of coming together in New York and the um, obligation and responsibility that we all feel in carrying forward the ideas, the conversations. And I see our coming together and the OSPOs for Good event hosted by the United Nations as a kind of uh, it's like the Big Bang, right? And I felt that 
we were all in the room. Uh, all the right people were in the room. We had all the, the most important, most significant open source communities there. We all agreed unequivocally that we have this extraordinary opportunity to accelerate uh, meeting the sustainable development goals through greater uh, implementation of open source technologies. But the biggest shock comes when we leave the room and we realize that our work is cut out for us because not enough people know still about this opportunity. And that's why this post-conference report is so important to have a deliverable, to have evidence, to have research that makes the case uh, that these communities exist, uh, that they're effective, that the technologies are important, that they are vital to achieving the goals. Um, and that now we begin the process of disseminating what we all were, were uh, experiencing to be true and, and validating, but it is incumbent upon all of us to, to take forward this knowledge and, and transform our governments, our, our procurement departments in government, um, transform enterprise. And if I have frustration, it is that not enough people in the world with um, decision-making authority, with resources, understand the things that we understand about the role of open source to accelerate the goals. I had the opportunity to attend COP28 in Dubai last year, and it was humbling to say the least, how few people I met at COP28 who knew what open source was, who had heard of the Linux Foundation, who had heard of the Linux kernel, who had heard anything about open source. It was shocking and humbling. And you think, wow, we really are only, we are in a bubble. We are in an echo chamber. So I want all of us in this room, we all now, now we know, and now we have this responsibility to go out into the world. And let's talk about SDGs at work in the world and bring in those who do not know we exist, bring in those decision makers, bring in those enterprises and educate them and advocate and become evangelists now. That is the extraordinary opportunity. The event was incredible, but I see it now as this big bang opportunity to go out in the world and evangelize what we know and bring in the people who really need to be in that room. And that's why I'm super excited about next year and this opportunity to expand the audience to, to decision makers and people who can really make things happen. So thank you to the UN for thinking big and bringing in those people who really need to be in that room, not just um, the open source folks and government leaders who already get it and see the opportunity. Canada is my home country and there's a shocking lack of understanding and I will take every opportunity I can to work with the UN and bring in the Canadian government to accelerate the use of open source. It's just, it's not good enough. So there's lots of work to be done. I'm inspired by the work and call on everybody to, to uh, evangelize uh, this opportunity. Thank you, Hillary. Um, so that's kind of the call to action. Like that's the the possibility of what we can do next. Um, but I'm kind of curious about you know perspectives in the room and perspectives from our panel on like what are the actual realistic possibilities of making that happen. Um, so next up we have Ruth. Um, Ruth, we talked a lot during the conference about the idea of harnessing this collective power of innovation and kind of the decentralized nature of the open source community to help drive innovation. Um, but because of that decentralization, there might be an organizing challenge. Um, many of the speakers and attendees at the conference differed in their perspectives on this, um, with some positive, some much more negative, um, on the possibilities of kind of driving collective action to address global challenges. So from your perspective, kind of working at the grassroots, do you have hope in bringing the open source community together? Like what might need to change to enable this? Yeah, sure. Uh, so it's nice to be here again during the stage with you all. Um, first, I, I do believe that uh, every human has the intent to do good, uh, except you're a terrorist, uh, so we all have <laughs> that intent to do good. And um, the, the first thing I think about with building a global community, because I've been in spaces where I have to bring different people together, right? That um, acknowledgement of the different issues, the different perspectives, 
the different the differences or the unique challenges that a group of people face, marginalized people face. First, it comes with the acknowledgement, right? Uh, even within open source, there's the time zone differences. Uh, I think I think in my talk yesterday, I shared about the infrastructural problems and challenges, logistics issue, and there, there's a long list of them. So, you know, first acknowledging that, um, and then you move from acknowledging to awareness. I think the OSPO for Good conference was a great place where, you know, a lot of people came together and there was the awareness of the different issues that different um, communities, countries, um, ecosystems face. And then when you go from awareness, I think empathy has a large place to play in this because if you are aware of a particular problem, um, you can as well say it's it doesn't concern me, right? Like this group faces this issue. They're not able to assess this, but because it's not my problem, I, 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 I can't go the extra mile or the extra step for them. But when you have empathy, when you lead in with empathy, you see that you feel their pain, you feel how difficult it is for them. And that's why when we talk about um, leveraging on like the open source community to um, achieve the SDGs, the SDGs are, are sensitive issues. These are issues that are, you know, connected to life, connected to that as well, you know, and these are really important issues. So if we want to achieve that, we need to change our perspective in the way we approach things, approaching with empathy, with bringing people, if we're building for the SDGs, um, are the communities that you're building for the most affected people, do they have a say in what you're building for? Can they define how this technology impacts them? So these are the different things I think we really need to think about. Uh, as we are approaching, as the UN is approaching the open source community and as the open source community is also um, approaching the UN because I, I believe they have kind of a veto power. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, these are the different aspects that uh, I think about with building. And, and then what success looks like is, like I said, um, you know, people knowing that their voices are being heard, um, like we are now going to have coffee next year. <laughs> um, you know, their voices are being heard. I, I, I can, I can, there's a path for me to go from being a contributor to being a leader to, you know, being in a room full of people that are decision makers. So yeah, those are the things I think about with building a global community in relation to the SDGs. Great, thank you. Um, my journey to open source came through the world of kind of global development and international cooperation. So I started working on technology and I eventually found my way to open source. And that's because I really believe in the open source community and the open source model. One of the parts of that is how honest the open source community is. Uh, and I think this is a really unique opportunity to, you know, put pressure on the UN and to kind of hold leaders to task for, for actually um, kind of driving change in the world. Um, so that, that kind of brought me to uh, Fiona. Fiona, I know you, you mentioned during our prep that you kind of had some uh, thoughts around what the UN could do. Um, so you were present as an attendee at the conference, though the Sovereign Tech Fund uh, and your co-founder Adriana um, keynoted at the beginning of day two. Um, and you were also representing Germany as a uh, co-sponsor of the conference. So kind of given this German model of open source cooperation, but also just all of your experiences, like what do you think is the role that the UN can play in the future global open source ecosystem? And you know, mm. what should we be making them do? <laughs> sure, thank you for the question, Nick. Um, so I think I really like the Big Bang picture that you're using, because I think from my perspective, it cannot be overstated what a pivotal moment this actually was. I've been working in open source funding for almost a decade. Uh, lots of you have been working on open source for, for a longer time. Um, and seeing the topics that we are dealing with, the issues that we're trying to draw our attention to, being leveraged to a global conference by the United Nations is really heartening. And I think it cannot be overstated how important that movement actually is. Because the, the Sovereign Tech Fund, so we invest in open source infrastructure. We, um, it's, we are funded by the German government. There's also Zendes. Uh, the keynote was a joint um, presentation by Sovereign Tech Fund and Zendes. Zendes functions almost like an, uh, kind of like an OSPO for the German government. Um, but you can 
you can create OSPOS as much as you want. You can invest in open source tools. You can try to introduce open source. Kind of going back to what I think Omkar said around security, the baseline will always be making sure that open source infrastructure is well maintained and is in a position where you can use it and it's safe, also for a longer time and it's sustainable. Um, and so the technologies that we invest in are actually global. So we are funded by the German government, but we are investing in open source technologies that are built um, all across the world. This is in fact a global resource. It's something that we all need. It's very similar to climate. We all need to care about it. And seeing this on a global stage um, with the UN being a central actor um, and using the, I think, incomparable convening power that the UN has, it's really a direction that I think this should be taking. We all need to, you know, as, as states, as companies, as actors in this field, we all need to invest. But um, if I've learned anything working in this field, and you all know this, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, we need more actors and not less. This is not an either or decision. Should industry, should companies, should uh, the private sector, should uh, the public sector, should this government or that government invest? We all have to. It's a global resource. We need it for any kind of goals that we have. Um, but we, at the same time, everyone needs to be part of it, but it better be well orchestrated. Um, I think collaboration, sharing our learnings, especially as we're now pioneering this field and we are developing new models. The model that we have in Germany is something that we're testing. It's basically like a test bit and we can figure out how does this work? How does this collaboration work? And we can share this model with the world. Um, is I think an important, it, it cannot be an afterthought that we think about how do we actually collaborate it in this field in a meaningful way, meaningful way, because if we don't, it could potentially also be harmful for a field that is uh, predominantly shaped by a lot of volunteers who do this in their free time. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of knowledge to be shared still. Um, so I think leveraging this to a new level that is global, but at the same time being orchestrated, but also getting new actors in. Because um, going back to what you said, sometimes those experiences can be very humbling. Um, and I think it's important for us to extend to get new actors in. And it's lovely to look into this audience. I actually know about 20 to 30 percent. Hello, friends. It's good to see you. <laughs> but I would also love to just enter a room, talk about these issues, and know, not know anyone. Um, because we need more people in this field. It's a behemoth of a task to address, and it will keep us busy for as long as we're using software uh, in the wider sense. Um, so yeah, I'm. I'm very excited about this movement, and I think that um, the UN taking up responsibility as a global actor that can coordinate and also get more actors in um, is, for me, a very, very positive and, yeah, and also like very moving and heartening um, direction that we're taking. Thank you. Nice. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Brief. Because now it's like the kind of free for all, right? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, if I'm going off free, script. Free for all. <laughs> uh, no, but I'm just what you're because I think that you know the conference that we had, it, you know, to some extent it was at this sort of high level, which is very important. This endorsement um, um, by you know high-ranking UN officials, etc. And you know what Nick was talking about was that the third day we had this fringe uh, or event side event where we. You know, I think that there are some people that had attended the conference who, who were quite sort of eager to to talk about sort of bring it down to what what can we actually do, and I think there what Fiona what you're talking about is, is really really important about um, what you are doing at the Sovereign Tech Fund because that it can create a model for this kind of collaboration. I think it's important also for LF Europe. I think the research and the LF research also on sort of how public the public sector sort of there's this great potential for use of open source in the public sector, a lot of interest. But I think where it falls down is, is has to do with procurement. Can public sector uh, open source projects be hosted by, you know, an organization like the Linux Foundation, for example? How can public sector officials sort of contribute to open source? The, a lot of possibility, like potential falls on those sort of the lack of having guidelines, models where things have actually worked, you know, to some extent. How can we have this kind of 
real collaboration, which is foreseen in the SDG 17. It's about collaborating for the SDGs. But can we really, as you know, we can all attend the same conference. We can have public sector officials, we can have policymakers, we can have industry people, we can have, um, you know, uh, the not for profit NGO sector. But can we actually sit down and collaborate together? Is there a form for how we engage? And I think this needs to be. This is something that needs to be sorted out, and that's why Sovereign Tech Fund is a kind of a, you know, you're doing a trailblazer uh, activity there. In Germany. Right, in Germany, but, you know, it's still, we need examples of yeah. how, yeah. Yeah. you know, you are investing in a private sector sort of, I guess, activity, uh, or, I mean, how you see that, but, I mean, I, I do think it's important. I just wanted to say that. Yeah, I'm just stating we did it in Germany because... It was hard, <laughs> but as you can imagine, but uh, we figured it out. And I think it's like when we started with the Sovereign Tech Fund, it was really clear for me and for, for my co-founder, Adriana, and myself, we have to make this work so we can show the world that this works. Mm -hmm. It does take effort. And um, I think uh, one of our uh, co-workers, when you mentioned procurement, I looked at my colleagues in the team who know very well. We know much more about procurement than we ever wanted to. Uh, but we once had a, like a workshop, and um, my colleague Tara coined one one session: how procurement bends time. <laughs> I think that's all you need to know about it. Uh, it does spend time. Things take longer, uh, but it takes like dedicated individuals to go through and figure out ways. And that's why I'm saying like we managed to do this stuff. We pulled it off in Germany. Uh, bound to EU procurement law. So um, this is also why we are so eager to share what we're doing with the world, because we would really love to see more sovereign tech funds across the globe. We would love to work with more organizations like ours. There's enough work to be done. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's here. We're here. Uh, we're happy to share everything that we've learned and um, share, share the pain, hold hands. Uh, but it's possible, and it needs to be done. It just takes dedication and commitment. Um, because no one can tell me anymore that it's not possible. And now that we've created this thing, there are less excuses. So we have a, a brief cushion, I think, of a few minutes given that we're near lunch. And I don't want to hold you all too much, but um, anybody else on the panel who wants to offer some kind of final remarks? And then maybe we have time for one or maybe two questions from the audience. Um, yeah, anyone else final remarks? OK, sure. We'd love to hear from you all um, some questions. So yes, gentlemen there. Um. Uh, as a French and uh, public regulated company in the energy, I really would like to benefit of a tag, a label, or maybe a certification to be an OSPO for good. It would be very helpful um, because uh, when I go to the regulation, when I go to the executive level, when I go to the field for the developer, it would be a symbolic, a big bang. Um, so I just want to mention that we do have something similar. They have the Digital Public Goods Registry, and that's a way of certifying kind of relevance for the SDGs. So that's something you can all look into. But um, anyone else wanted to offer thoughts? Yeah. Uh, for the chaos project we're trying to set up a kind of a working group for social impact uh, connected to the sdgs so it was as a result of the conference as well um so we did have like a non-conference session uh yesterday but we are in the process of setting up the working group so if you could join the chaos group so we could figure things out together metrics and uh, sdgs yes anyone else in the panel Anyone else? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for a great discussion. And uh, in Japan, uh, OSPO has just started, uh, especially industry side. Uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, government and uh, academic side, uh, the awareness is not so much. So I'd like to uh, promote that as a Japan Evangelist of the Linux Foundation. So uh, I think uh, Europe is a uh, very proceeded the understanding of the open source in government and uh, uh, university and so on. So what is the uh, engine or what is from Mozart? Uh, please let me know. Would anyone like to respond? Omar? Hi, thank you very much. So, uh, 
a yeah, couple of things that I can start with is that I don't think we've been good at telling the story. I think there are so many successes that the open source community could do in global. And I'm shocked but back to what Hillary said. Decision makers don't know about it. We're really in, in, uh, we're in our bubble. So we need to, us together, be able to tell the story. And this OSPO for Good was a great way because we had decision makers, we had governments there in the room. So this is why we want to do more and more of these kind of things. And uh, we're now looking at doing smaller groups, smaller regional OSPOs for Good in Africa and Asia and so on, where we only target decision makers in that specific region. So this is one of the aspects I want to do. Another thing I want to talk about is that building an OSPO is not easy. It's complicated because, as I said this morning, it's not in the DNA of a government to be open. Like uh, we spent two years building the OSPO of the UN, and you, you don't know the pain, the blood that went. That was blood, <laughs> sitting in front of lawyers and say we're opening everything. Like what plan? Where, like you're an alien. So. And I know working with the Germans building Zendis, which is the agency, was a painful, long process. So here we also need to find ways to help government build OSPOs. I think they need to be some technical assistance, some group of us, a group of people. It could be UN or happy to work with others where we'll be able to not only train them to what it is an OSPO, but also give them what I, what I call an OSPO in the box, a toolkit. This is what you need for the OSPO to be up and running quickly. Once we, I, to your point, we need to convince them, but when they come up and say, I want to build an OSPO, they shouldn't be on their own because it's really long and painful. We should be able to hold their hand. This is something that I believe we UN should be able to play some role there. Yeah, I, it's interesting because um, uh, with Open Forum Europe, I've, uh, I've been with them since 2007. We have been always focused on sort of public sector um, acceptance and adoption of open source. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we wrote a study which was published by the European Commission, where we looked at um, open source policies. We looked at the economic impact of open source in Europe, and also uh, we looked at open source policies across the world. And actually, it's interesting because there we found that Japan and South Korea actually were quite ahead of Europe at some point when it, looked, when it came to uh, government interest in open source. Now, this latest sort of trend towards sort of building public sector government OSPOs uh, in Europe, which is where I focus mostly, it's true that now there's a kind of, there's a trend. Um, and if you look at how these things happen, it is quite interesting because often they are driven by ind individuals, I would say, to some extent. There can be sort of these champions, evangelists that are existing inside the, the public sector, supported by sort of a bigger, obviously, the sort of open source community and sometimes pressures from the open source community that, you know, um, public um, sort of public money should go towards uh, open source technologies and um, but what is different with OSPOs is really that we are trying to stop we you know this sh it shouldn't rely on uh, a certain political interest maybe a political party or uh, some champion within the government but we're building an institution where you know and I'm a political science background, so we know that once you have an institution, once you have a budget line, once you have uh, people whose job it is to run some, something, then they, it becomes like a self-perpetuating thing, right? So the key is really to get into that first step where you have something that becomes institutionalized. And there you need this kind of high-level endorsement, which we're talking about, but you also need um, a plan for when there is a kind of interest in something from the high level, a model or something to be able to to suggest that okay, let's let's do this OSPO. You know, this will make this politician look good or or this department look good because we're doing something that's kind of everybody's doing it and we'll be the first in Asia or something like that with a with an with an OSPO. And you create this kind of opportunity. You install something that becomes something lasting, and you'll have people working full-time as they're part of their full-time job to make this a success and so that they can continue to kind of um, argue for their continued existence. This is how you kind of build institutions, I think, in the public sector. Yeah. 
Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, just right. to, to add really quickly to this, because uh, it's a good question. I, I have two answers to this. Um, on the one hand, it's not easy to talk about open source infrastructure. It's not easy to talk about preventative care and like maintaining infrastructure. So I think to a certain extent, you always have to find out what's there and what's because the, open source is beneath everything. So pick your story. Um, for us, it was uh, like where there were a lot of things coming together at the same time. There was the, um, the, the rise of the term digital sovereignty by the EU. There were, we worked with the um, uh, Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action. And like obviously open source contributes to all of these, like, uh, like almost, I think to a certain extent, a lot of SDG, uh, like SDGs can be like underpinned or have to be underpinned by open source and available technologies. And um, so it was important to identify the story that we need to tell and like think in more, um, what you call it? Um, um, hori not the horizontal, the Vertical. verticals. Yes, thank you. It's a good term. <laughs> Should memorize it. Um, and uh, to jump on these terms because we look very closely at what the next coalition would be doing and um, and then sort of serve it to them and say, oh, you want to do this and that. Well, here's an important part of it. On the other hand, um, I think looking at how this field has developed, um, as we mentioned before, it's still hard to like get people to rally behind the issues that we're talking about. But on the other hand, we've made so much progress. The way that we talk, the people that like use terms like open source infrastructure and maintenance, it has really grown and made incredible steps. We still have a lot of work to do, but having been in this field and looking at it, we're really at a very different part. So I'm also positive, also with the developments that we're seeing, um, that the issues that we we care about, that we can share this care with more and more people and institutions in the future. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to end it there. Thank you to everyone who came out today. Oh, one last word for Omar. Um, just a, a big plug to you know get in touch with any one of us if you want to offer feedback on some of the ideas we talked about or discuss ways to get involved. We'd very much um, appreciate your involvement and your support. And you know, watch the space. There's there's more going to happen. Um, but final word to Omar. Very quickly, just a call to action because at the end of the conference, everybody came is like, okay, I'm convinced. How can I help the SDGs? How can I help the UN? I want what? What can I do? And here, I just want to promote two things that we're that are coming up now by before the end of the year. First is the UN Open Source Portal. So it's going to be under open source that UN dot org. So we're going to be our one stop shop. That's the place where you're going to come and see everything that we want to share with the open source community. There will be a lot of links to projects from the different agencies that we would want you to help us develop and, 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 and help us code. There will be a list of all the events, all the resources. So stay tuned. This is coming very soon. And another thing I quickly want to touch upon, we've been working on something called UN Open Source Principles. What does it mean to do open source? What are some of the values that anybody would want to interact with us or with each other within the open source community, what are those values? So these are be 10 values and uh, they will be published hopefully by the end of the year and we will call on you to endorse them. We want as many organizations around the world to endorse those UN open source values so that we have a, a common set of principles that we all uh, abide with. So this is these two are concrete outcomes that came up out of OSPO, and then hopefully by the new year we'll be announcing a lot more. But yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you.